a year earlier. I'm sorry you're going to have to put up with me again. Um, but I'll try to cut it short in righteousness. And uh, I'm going to start by talking about five leaders you can not, you can't do without. Uh, I hear I've got somebody who's um, he's checking everything I say. He's also a doctor. I won't pinpoint who it is. So I've got to be careful I say the right thing. And apparently you're going to put me on your YouTube. I don't know, should I stand like this? Anyway, I'm not a YouTube fan. I, I love to watch YouTube, but I, I, I'm not sure that I, I would look uh, good on YouTube. But five liters you can, can't do. So what's in the blood? There are five liters that you cannot do without. More or less five liters. Water, protein, cells, and salts. Those are the, the four things that are in the blood. But what makes it so special, and we're going to come to it in a second, the blood is the vehicle that God uses to keep you alive because it carries oxygen. Now of the three things that man needs to survive, oxygen, water, and food, they claim you can do three weeks without food, depending of course on how much extra you've got, um, three days without water. Some people can last longer if you recycle it. You get the code for that. <laughs> you recycle it, you can live longer. But you can only last about five minutes without oxygen. And, of course, if you're a child, if you have uh, what they call a reflex, reflex laryngeal spasm, you fall into an ice pool, you will last longer. But most adults, it's only about five minutes. And so, <laughs> really what I'm going to be mostly focusing on is the red blood cells. What are red blood cells? This is serious trivia. Scientists estimate, nobody really knows, there's about 25 trillion red blood cells in that 5 liters. Every second your body manufactures between 2 and 3 million red blood cells. Every second, whether you're awake, whether you're sleeping or whatever. Those cells are 6 to 8 micrometers. Keep that in your mind because you're going to see that unless you were put together at once, it's impossible that you evolved a system like the red blood cell system. Where do they come from? They come from the bone marrow. What's so special about them? Well, <laughs> number one, they carry blood to the whole of the body. Number two, they go through capillaries. Capillaries are just fine tubes. Most of the finest ones are in your brain. But the, the, the diameter of the capillary is 3 to 10 micrometers. Now, what did I say keep in your mind? The red blood cell is 6 to 8 micrometers. How do you get something that's 6 to 8 micrometers into a tube that's only 3 micrometers? Just happened, didn't it? Fancy. I mean, you wake up, or, or let's, let's just uh, think about it. You evolve and then you've got blood cells that are 8 micrometers and they all of a sudden they come across a tube that's 3 micrometers, they can't get through, there's no blood going to your brain, you have a stroke, you die, but then you pass that on to your, uh, the next one down the line, there's a problem in the brain, you've got to do something. No, it doesn't make sense. These red blood cells have a special coat. It's flexible and it can deform, and scientists only discovered this in 2006. It's made of six different proteins. Remember that some scientists calculated that to make one protein of 100 amino acids, we're talking about one protein of 100 amino acids, you have the possibility of 1 times 10 to the 140 options to make one protein. Inside any human cell, there's probably between 10 to 20,000 different proteins. Almost none of them 
are, or shouldn't say almost none of them, most of them are not only 100 amino acids. So these red blood cells, they can be formed, number one, and that's some diagram which uh, shows how the red blood cell, if you looked at the original picture, uh, just get it back again, you can see that the red blood cell has got a dimple in the middle. So if you, I, I don't have a, a side on view, but the side on view would be this, like a, a bit of a donut, but it's not a, a complete hole, and there's something connecting it. And <laughs> pardon me, so when it hits, a small tube, it, it deforms itself, there's the red blood cell coming, it needs to get over to the other side, and there it deforms itself, making itself smaller, because the coat of the red blood cell that I spoke about, that's made up of those six proteins, collapses in on itself, and can fold itself, so that it can get through to the other side, and in the last slide you see that the red blood cell has gone through. Blood comes from, <laughs> pardon me, the, the bone marrow, as, as, I, as I said to you, and it's formed from a hematopoietic stem cell. That stem cell forms the multipotential stem cell. Think about it. Keep it in your mind. This cell forms all the other cells. One cell carries within itself the information carries within itself what is needed to form all the other cells. And all these cells will be, reformed, will be formed in uh, response to certain stimuli. If you're exposed to a virus, you will form lymphocytes. If you're exposed to a bacteria, you will form macrophages. Notice, there's a... <laughs> the macrophages and they are divided into neutrophils, those get formed with bacteria, the lymphocytes are what come across when you, when you get viruses, and the eosinophils, when you are allergic to something, your eosinophil count goes up, and here are the platelets, those are involved in, the, um, in what we're going to look at in a second, but that one cell forms those other cells. I mean, can we say, give God the glory? God is not a genius. That's the way we would in, uh, cat categorize a person who's got an IQ over, by, over 140. God's IQ is over infinity. It's beyond infinity. We, we, we can't understand, we can't grasp it, because this was all put together by a, a, a God who's beyond genius. I don't know if I, I must have skipped it perhaps, but the red blood cells are the only cells that do not have a nucleus. Okay, every other cell has got a nucleus. The nucleus is the, the code, the instructions that are needed to put the cell together and to make a human being. And the red blood cells are the only cells that do not have a nucleus. And the reason for that is that they can fit more hemoglobin if they don't have a nucleus. And because they deform such a lot, the red blood cells break down every 120 days. And there's a system to recycle them. They get broken down by the liver and some of the, the, the breakdown products will go out, but all the rest will be reutilized uh, uh, by the body. And this was discovered by accident serendipitous they discovered what happens when you cut yourself. Here's another conundrum. You have evolved from wherever and you cut yourself. How do you stop bleeding? Well, if there was no mechanism to stop bleeding, you would bleed to death. But there are 22 proteins involved in that cascade. It's called the Co coagulation cascade and one of them is this protein here it's, I call it the Swiss army knife of the clotting cascade that protein is a very large protein and it's got not <coughs> sorry nine different functions 
And when you do science or biochemistry at school, you learn that a protein has to fold itself in a specific configuration. We're not talking here about millimeter squares. We are talking about angstroms. And angstrom is the width of an electron, the width of, a, of the nucleus of, a, of, of an atom. So we are talking about absolutely minute sizes, but if this protein doesn't fold itself perfectly, the, <coughs> pardon me, the area where the reaction takes place is not the right shape. Things are not going to happen. And without enzymes and certain proteins, what happens in your body, which you don't think about, would be taking years. But now it's happening many thousands of times per second, some of the things. So this coagulation cascade has got 20 different proteins. It starts off with a contact, there's a damaged thing. Then you have uh, the, the one factor, factor 12, becoming factor 12A, and that will then start working on factor 11, and you'll get more and more and more and more things happening. That's why it's called a cascade, coagulation cascade. So one protein will give you a uh, hundred, that hundred will give you a thousand, that thousand will give you ten thousand, and so on and so on, until you find, end up at the, the bottom by a clot of fibrin which plugs that hole, and that's it. So, <laughs> pardon me, the reason I, uh, I brought this up, I had originally intended to talk about it at the beginning, but I find it so tied into what I want to look at today. And I've entitled this message, Free But Not. And we're going to be looking at First Peter. So let's uh, open our Bibles. If you have your Bibles, if you have your phone, if you can get away from uh, whatever other site you want and open a Bible on your phone, please let's turn to First Peter chapter 1. And before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Dear merciful and loving Heavenly Father, the God who not only put the universe together, but put human, humans together. Who knelt down in the dust to breathe life into Adam. And Father, we, we, we ended up with something that is beyond our understanding. And so Father, I just invite your presence here in this uh, auditorium. Father, in this auditorium of people that I've never met. But Father, you knew them from before they were born. As David said, you knit us together in your mother's womb, in our mother's wombs. So you knew them from before they were born. Father, you knit them together perfectly. Father, we were talking about it outside. Millions of things were happening every second as the DNA was being copied and you ended up with a baby that was perfect in every way. And Father, we, we seem to think that that's something that should just happen all the time. But we know we've met people where it hasn't happened. And we know there are some people that it doesn't happen at all. And as a result, a baby doesn't get born. So Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your, your uh, genius that you've applied to bring about life. And as we open the word together, Father, please open our hearts and our minds. Help us to see that this world is going to come to an end and that you have something better prepared for us. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I've forgotten his name, but a professor of psychology did an experiment at Duke University where he offered 398 students either a free, a free Hershey bar or a lint ball at a uh, 70 or 80 whatever percentage discount. And uh, most of you, I think, would say, well, I'd probably go for the lint maybe. Or if, you, if you've eaten chocolate, uh, I, I used to eat chocolate before I was, uh, was brought to my senses. The good Lord woke me up. I was telling the people earlier, 
I'd have a 200 gram slab in about uh, seven minutes, but uh, <laughs> I don't anymore. But most of the students chose the freebie. They didn't want to pay for lint, although it was heavily discounted. They wanted something free. And that's what mankind is like, isn't it? We love to have, to score a bargain, to get something for nothing, <laughs> pardon me. And here this afternoon, sorry, wow, uh, I've got about 10 minutes, so you better turn your listening ears up because I've got to get through in 10 minutes time. We're going to look at something that's free but not. And we're going to use these verses from the scriptures. First Peter chapter 1 verse 17. And I've got highlighted this. Those that are not in blue, I want us to keep in mind. For if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Now, you know, this is what, something that I find amazing about the Bible. I can, I've read it many times, probably not as many times as I should, but each time I read it, I find something new and something fresh. The scriptures are just amazing. There's no other book like the Bible. No other book. You can read it every day, but you will always find something fresh and new. And here, <laughs> uh, notice what it says here. Who impartially judges according to each one's work. And then we could, we could stop there and we could talk um, about judgment, but no, 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 that's, that's not a very popular topic. Let's not even go there. Let's not even mention the word judgment. Nobody wants to hear about it. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. You suffer from fool? You heard of fool? You've heard of FOMO, surely. We've all heard of FOMO. But here Paul, Peter is highlighting full wall. I just made it up, but that's why you haven't heard of it before. <laughs> Futile way of life. Full wall. So anybody here suffer from full wall? Nobody's going to say so. <laughs> Inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So, pardon me, let's put this in the context. Whenever we open the scriptures, we must always look at the context. We don't just read a passage and say, right, this means X, Y, Z. We've got to look at the context. What's, what's the context of this message? Notice what Peter says right at the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 1. If you've got your Bible open, my Bible says, to the pilgrims. But the King James Version says, to the aliens. Certain other Bible says aliens, King James says, sorry, strangers. The bottom line is that the people that Peter was addressing this message to were not the locals. They were living in a strange place, and they were living in a place with strange customs, and they were living in a place where they didn't fit in. And we've got to just quickly think of those implications. And he says here, you have elect for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. That's I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. They were sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. They were washed. They were, were renewed. They were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But the immediate context of our verses is 1 Peter 1 verse 15 and 16. And let's read that. And, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. We are looking at 1 Peter 1, verse 17, 18, and 19. But the immediate content, context is verse 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You know, the word holy is a very common word in the Bible. And in fact, I did a Google Dex. You know what a Google Dex is? 
Guys, I mean, are you, are you, am I leaving you behind me on a Google Dixies? Okay, I made it up myself. A Google Dex is where you punch a question into Google and you end up with so many hits. Okay, does it make sense? So I punched into Google, God is love. And I got a Google Dex of 217 trillion, 2160 trillion. So in other words, there were 2160 million, uh, thousand uh, billion, million, uh, billion hits for God is love. That's the Bible. Does God ever say in the Bible, I am love? Yes. Yes. Careful. No. The Bible in the first, in John chapter, first John, it says God is love. But does God himself say he is love? No. And then I punched him, God is holy. And that came up 427 million times. So five times more hits for God is love over God is holy. But how many times does God in the Bible say himself, I am holy. But mankind is looking after a God of love. But God never says of himself, I am love. And the word holy is in the scriptures more than 468 times, but the word love is only in the scriptures 200 odd times. So this thing, and maybe I'm getting a bit sidetracked here because uh, there's time constraints and so on. This idea, this concept of holiness is one that has slipped almost like un, not only underneath the, the, the seat, but underneath the carpet, underneath the floor. It's maybe somewhere down in the, in the basement. But friends, this is serious stuff. God says, be holy because I am holy. And to be holy doesn't mean that you elevate it to a certain level, that you become so, so, sort of a, a wonder kid of Christianity. To be holy means that you've separated yourself from the world. That's what holy means. It means to set apart for a holy use. That is why when the Bible is, was written, God, the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day and did what? He sanctified it. He made it holy. And if you read the first, pardon me, the first two books of the Bible, that same word as holy in Genesis is holy in Exodus chapter 2 verse 8. And what does it say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's the same word. So God set aside a century in time that was set apart for a sacred use and God is calling us, you and me, not just me, you and me, all of us. And Peter is mentioning it here, that we should be setting ourselves aside from the world. That doesn't mean we're cutting ourselves off from the world. We're just setting aside, ourselves aside from the world. You see, what the world is focused on, we're not really focused on. Because what the world is focused on, where is it going, man? Is it getting any better? Is, is, is poverty getting any better? Are people's living standards getting any better? Uh, is there less wars or less... Are there less floods? Are there less national disasters? Are things improving? Come on! The things of the world are going down and they're going down big time. And when we're focusing our, thing, our attention and our energy on the world, we're getting tied into what is in the world. But Peter is saying, like the one who called you, the Holy One who called you, be holy because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So now we're still looking at the immediate context. Gee, sorry, I've got to run. I've got to keep going. Notice in verse 20 and verse 21, it says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. There alone we could stop and talk about it, but I'm going to pass on. But what manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You see, we don't believe, as I said earlier, we don't believe in so-so stories. We don't believe in something that hasn't uh, taken place. So, if you address God as your Father, 
If you have made a cognitive decision, if you have made a mental decision to address God as your Father, that sets a line in the sand where you are separating yourself. You are calling upon God. God is your Father. And God as your Father, He is tied in with you and tied to you in a different way. <laughs> Pardon me. He, he judges, but He judges impartially. And he judges according to our work. That word conduct is a special word. It really means to turn down, to wheel about. So God is going to judge our conduct, but it's conduct that is referring to the moral and spiritual aspect of our lives. You know, I was talking today uh, to some friends I go to Villawood. Some of you may know this. I may have mentioned it before. And at Villawood, uh, I have a study every Sabbath morning. So when most of you may still be in bed, I'm up and I'm going to Villawood. But something has happened in paradise. One of the Christians, I won't name him, one of the Christians is threatening people who don't give him what he wants. He's giving Christianity a bad name. He, he lends or gives somebody a Optus card. It's apparently used as, uh, they, they don't have money in Villawood. Uh, you don't know this, but it doesn't matter. They don't have ordinary money. They have Villawood currency, Villawood money. And so you, you earn points during the week. You go to the gym and you get Villawood dollars. And you do this uh, program, you get Villawood dollars. So he buys up his phone cards with these Villawood dollars and then he gives it to people and he wants two dollars, two cards back for one dollar, for one uh, card. Oh, that's extortion, isn't it? I mean, I give you one card, but you must give me two cards back. And if you don't give me two cards back, I take your phone away and I threaten you. So, he's giving Christianity a bad name. People don't want to come to his Bible study. Because this guy is threatening them physically, threatening them verbally, sorry, not physically, but he's threatening them to use verbal force. <laughs> and here the word conduct in West word studies from the Greek New Testament is talking about the moral and spiritual aspect of the manner of our lives. So we must conduct ourselves in fear as it says in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1 verse 17 conduct yourselves throughout your time of stay in fear what does that really mean what does fear mean does it mean that we must be um, scared the Bible commands fear God in Deuteronomy 13 verse 4. I'm not going to go there. In Revelation 14 verse 7. God commands fear. What is fear? And why do we need to fear God? We fear God for His holiness. The greatness of God. Why do we fear Him? The goodness of God. The forgiveness of God. The works of God. And the judgment of God. Those are all reasons why we fear God. Sorry, I'm going very quickly because I want to... Uh, want to uh, get through. So what is fear? Phobos is a Greek word phobos. It means to flee from and refers to flight or alarm. But we don't need to cringe or grovel. Biblical fear means, and here the same word is being used in Acts 2 verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs. You see, just think about it for a second, please. Here is man, and somewhere where nobody can see, somewhere where nobody can experience, somewhere where nobody can reach, is God. Surely, there's a difference between God and us. You see, God is sinless, and we are sinful. God is perfect, and we are imperfect. God is divine and we are human. God is immortal and we are mortal. God is above all and we are bound to this earth. You see, there's a big gulf between God and ourselves. 
So when we come into God's presence, when we come into God's presence, surely, friends, brothers and sisters, young people, we wouldn't be treating God the way we would treat our mates. Hey, mate, come and sit down. Yeah, have a good time, buddy. You know what I mean? We would not if some celebrity were to walk in the door. I was uh, happened to be eating my dinner the other night and some, what's her name? Caitlin? Is it Caitlin Jenner? Or, uh, some model, apparently the most famous model in the world. Got paid all this money just to walk around with a ring, uh, with a, a necklace hanging on her neck. She walked in. I mean, just another person. And uh, everybody was like giving her space, and there was all these security guards and all this fuss going on. But just imagine when God came down in, <laughs> pardon me, and Moses was there and he was walking, the mountain was shaking, and the people were running. They were running from real fear. They knew that this was God and this was them and God had come down to visit them. And so friends, uh, in, in, in our modern narrative where we know everything and God, we know everything about God, we think we can approach Him in any way. We've got no idea of what, <laughs> pardon me, what is called the magisterium of the holiness of God. Because God is God. And we are human. And we think we can bring him down to our level. Some of us feel that we can keep him in our back pocket for when we're in trouble. And then when we're in trouble, we just take him out and we polish him up. And God, you can, I'm in trouble, won't you please help me? The Bible says that we should fear God and give God glory. God keeps us alive. Every breath that we take, is really a miracle from God. I was telling people the other day, there are nine different areas of your brain and 15 muscles that are involved in one breath. So isn't that a miracle? Yes. And, <laughs> pardon me, and so we have a fear, a, a sense of, of awe, of reverence. We're in God's presence. And this word, refers to the feeling produced when one realizes God is at hand. Let's move on. Our stay is on the earth. We're not here forever. And we are not going to stay here forever. We know <laughs> that we are redeemed. And Paul, Peter goes on to say that we've been liberated. That word redeemed means liberated by the payment of ransom from our futile, perishable thing, uh, ways, our futile ways of life. And he says, but we're not redeemed with perishable things. We're not redeemed with things that are going to be the tarmac of heaven. Because the Bible is very clear, we're going to walk on gold. The tarmac of heaven, I mean, so what? If I say to you, look, I'm going to kill your child unless you give me some tarmac, you would say, this guy's nuts. But We've not been redeemed by those perishable things. We've been redeemed by something which is, I, 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 I uh, like to think of it as priceless, something that cannot be, be uh, quantified. And Peter talks about the futile way of life. We redeem from this futile way of life, from things, from achievements, from pursuits. Those are all things that are going to come to an end. They are all temporary things. They are not lasting, they are not eternal, and they're going to come to an end. And what's the use? And, and, and please don't think that I'm saying, oh, you must give up your university, you must give up everything, you must just become a recluse, and you must, mustn't uh, contact the world. I'm not meaning that at all. But we always look at what we're doing and ask ourselves, is what I'm doing of benefit to me as a Christian? Is this making me a better Christian? Am I going to use this for God's glory? Am I going to take the skills that God gives me and am I going to use them to God's glory? Am I going to take the gifts that God gives me and am I going to use those gifts to God's glory? Or am I just engaged in some futile pursuit? For example, learning uh, um, a language they speak in Palau. You know Palau? 
You, have you heard of Palau? There's one person that's heard of Palau. Do you know somebody who lives there? I've got a lot of medical supplies I need to send to Palau. I had to look it up on Google. I've never heard of the place, but it's a country. But the point is that we need to look at what we are tied up in, what we engross in, and uh, forsake those futile ways of life. You see, God had a plan. Peter says that before the foundation of the world, Jesus was sent. He was sent to be our sacrificial lamb. We were sinners. We needed a savior. And Jesus came. He made blood, but he also spilled blood. He didn't spill your blood. He didn't spill my blood. He spilled his own blood. And he did it because he loved you. He did it for a reason. He did it for a purpose. Because he saw value in each one of you, including myself. He left heaven. For 4,000 years, he had that mental torment. I don't know how he dealt with it. That he was going to come to this earth. And that he was going to meet with ridicule. He was going to meet with persecution. His own family wouldn't believe him. But not only that. He was going to go and he was going to hang and he was going to die in agony. He was going to be naked. He was going to be bleeding. He was going to lose control of his bowels and his bladder. But he was doing it for a reason. For a purpose. You see, it's free, but it's not. There was a cost to eternal life. And that cost was Jesus' blood. Because the Bible is clear, if no blood is spilt, there's no forgiveness of sins. So if you're a sinner, you need the blood of Jesus. If you look through your life, through the catalog of your life, through the memories in your mind, and you see that nothing makes sense, nothing has taken you anywhere, you've achieved nothing, and you realize you need Jesus in your life, He's waiting. He's wanting. The Bible is so clear. He wants to sit down and talk to you. He wants to sit across the table. He wants to have some eye time with you. Look at you from across the table. And say, my child, I love you. I died for you. For a reason. You see, it's free. But it's not. God in his great love and mercy, sent Jesus to rescue us from the mess that we're in. We've got to admit it. We are in a mess. We're going nowhere without Jesus. We're achieving nothing without him. And we'll end up nowhere if he's not in our lives. Let's close our eyes. Father, I just want to thank you for all the words that you've given me. Father, I'm not worthy of all your goodness and your mercy. But Father, Jesus came to die for each one of us that's in this auditorium today. Each one of us that's in your sanctuary today. And Father, I, I, I get this feeling that there is some person sitting here today, some young person, some young man or some young woman who knows in their heart. They may be sitting here like I sat in church many, many years ago. I was present bodily but not mentally. I was present physically but I wasn't present spiritually. There may be some young person here today, Father, who hears and who feels the Holy Spirit talking to them, asking them to make a decision, who understands that Jesus is knocking at their heart's door, asking to come inside. And Father, for a long time now, they've been putting it off. 
but now it's crunch time. The Spirit is here pleading with Him. And oh Lord, we know that this is not going to go on forever. So if there is some young person here today, young man or young woman who knows that their life is futile, who knows that they haven't been giving Jesus the, the place in their lives that He deserves, who recognizes that grace is free, but it came at a cost, not to us, but to you. And who wants to commit themselves to you today, Father, won't that young person just put their hand up now. Just say, here I am, Lord, please take me now. Father, every eye is closed and every head is bowed. We're not looking at numbers, Father. We're looking for hearts. You're not interested in numbers. You're not a God of numbers. You're a God of commitment. You made a commitment to save the world before the world was made. And you carried through with it. And now you're looking for us to make a commitment to follow you all the way. Won't you just respond to the Spirit's call today? While the door of mercy is still open, you know in your heart where you are. You know what you've been doing. You know that your life is really not going the way you want it to go and that you've got that empty, aching feeling. That void that hasn't been filled because only God, only Jesus can fill that void. If you in that position today, won't you raise your hand today? Won't you acknowledge your need of Jesus in your life? And won't you put him first? And Father, you know what's in our hearts. You know what's in our minds. You can read our thoughts. There may be some other person. They may be older. They may have been coming to church for a long time, but they know that they, the spiritual life has been slipping and they've been, become lax and careless and they want to commit themselves to you. Won't they raise their hand now at this time, Father? Won't they say, Lord, please, I want to recommit to you that you are going to be my God. You are going to be the Lord of my life. You are going to take charge of my life. You are going to take over in my life. I'm going to give everything to you first and put you first. If there's some older person who's in that position who wants to make that commitment, won't you raise your hand now? Won't you give Jesus the place he deserves in your life as Lord and as ruler. He's your savior because he came to redeem you. He came to pay the penalty that you should have paid so that you can have the life that he is offering, life eternal. Father, we can't do this forever. We must bring it to an end, but while this plea is still going out. If somebody wants to respond, won't you raise your hand right now, Father? Please, Holy Spirit, please be speaking to them. If they find themselves in the valley of decision, urging them to make that decision to commit to you and to experience what I experienced in 1979, the peace and the joy that came from knowing Jesus. The peace that, was, that passed all understanding. The peace that I knew was real. It wasn't some dream, it wasn't some illusion, it was real peace. And life was never the same. So Father, we ask Him, because You are a God of mercy and of love. Father, we thank You for Your goodness and Your mercy, Your, your watch care over us. And Father, if there's somebody here today who was prompted by the Holy Spirit to raise their hand but did not do that, who was for one reason or another, reluctant to make a commitment. Father, please give them no peace today until they go down on their knees, wherever they may be at home, in their closets, in the privacy of their rooms, to commit themselves to you and to put you first in their lives. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy and your love. And we give you the glory for all that you do for us and in us and through us is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.